right, let's let us get started. So yesterday, um, we were talking about land sales. When you sell a piece of property, <coughs> if there are imperfections in the property, such that there are certain portions of the field that cannot be used for planting, they're not arable, so the halacha is they're not included in the acreage of sale. And the example of <coughs> the, what, what the Mishnah had told us is, is that if you have rock formations that are higher than ten fachim or crevices in the ground that are deeper than ten fachim, you cannot count that in the acreage of the sale because it's not usable. So <coughs> what we saw yesterday was the Gemara quoting a Mishnah. And this Mishnah in Erechim talks about the idea of being poded, a piece of agricultural property, for what the Torah says, chamishim uh, shekel kesef, there's a fixed price for a certain kind of acreage. And that only applies when you're redeeming from hektish agricultural real estate. If you're redeeming something that's not plantable, so then the law doesn't apply. And so the Mishnah had said over there that if there are crevices that are deeper than tent fachim, since it's not plantable, it's not, it, the law of chamishim shekel kesef does not apply to that kind of property. It would only apply to the surrounding property, but when you redeem back that crevice, you'd have to <coughs> attach its actual uh, valuated price. <coughs> so the Gemara's question was, I will grant you that it's not considered to be a contiguous piece of real estate, but why isn't it plantable? You can go down into the crevice and plant whatever you want there. So the Gemara had answered because contextually, we must be talking about a crevice that is filled with water. It's like a pond. It's not just an empty crevice. It's a crevice that's filled with water. And that's the reason why it's not treated as agricultural real estate. The Gemara had then said, Dikanami. We can infer this from the language of the mission over there because the two cases were a rock formation that's ten fachim high versus a crevice that's ten fachim deep. Just like a rock formation cannot be used for planting, so therefore the crevice must also not be usable for planting. So the Gemara's question is, Ihachi, if that's the case, then Afilu Pachos Mikan Nami. Well, then why don't, and this is where we're up to on Daf Kuf Gimel Amid Beis, it's like in the middle of the Amid. The question then is, well, why then is that only true for crevices and rock formations that are more than 10 Pachim? Why don't you say that the same thing for things that are. I'm an Amidalot, you said Sorry, Kufkin will amadal two minutes. Why, why don't you say the same thing then for crevices if they're not plantable and rocks if they're not plantable? Why don't you say the same thing if they're less than ten fachim? If you can't use them for planting, then the law of chamishim uh, shekel kesef shouldn't apply. So the Gemara answers Hanahu nagani da aramikru shadari da aramikru, because when something is less than ten fachim above the ground or below the ground, it is considered to be completely ancillary to the surrounding property. It's considered to be a mound of the land or a fissure in the land. And therefore, it's considered to be part of the property, and therefore, it's, part, it's counted as part of the acreage. It has to have some distinct kind of feature so that it's so far removed from the surrounding property that it's considered to be a separate piece of property. Mm -hmm. So you need two qualifications. Number one, it's got to be above or below tent fachim from the surrounding soil. And number two, it can't be plantable. And that's what that Mishnah Nerechen was talking about. So now the Gemara's question is hachamai. So we know in our Mishnah, all we've said so far is the feature of height or depth is what excludes it from the sale. What about its plantability, its arability? Is that also a feature? Is that also what our Mishnah is implying, just like the Mishnah in Erechim? So Amar Rav Papa, Afal Bishain Malayamayim. So Rav Papa says no. Even if a crevice that's ten tefachim deep is not filled with water and you could theoretically plant in it, it is still, you still not, can, cannot include that in the measurements of the base core that you're selling to your customer. My time, Because when I, buy, <coughs> when I buy a piece of property, I'm interested in one contiguous piece of property that I can plant on all in one day, in one fell swoop. I'm not interested in having to plant on one part of it and then have to bring all of my apparatus to another part and plant at a separate time. That's not the reason why I bought this property. And therefore, even though a crevice, you can get down into the crevice and plant in it, but that's not what I bargained for when I bought this property. A person does not want to purchase one contiguous property and then have it appear like it's separate pieces of property. 
So maske flo ravina va hadumi de slime ketani ma slime de lav ben israinin who have honey nomi not de lav ben israinin. So Rav, Ravina, though, asks the same diuk that we had made before in, in Mishnah and Erechim. Just like there we had compared the crevice to a rock formation, why don't we say, and, and therefore to conclude that a crevice is not plantable, why don't we say the same thing in our Mishnah? Our Mishnah also cr- compares the crevice to a rock formation, so therefore you should say that uh, it's also not plantable, it must be filled with water. So Gemara says, no. Kikatani dumya desloyim apachos mikan. In our Mishnah, there are two parts to the Mishnah. There's the first part, which says that if it's higher or deeper than ten tefachim, it's not included in the sale. And the second part is, is that if it's less than ten tefachim, high or deep, then it is included in the sale. And that's where we're making the comparison, only in the second statement, which is as follows, that as long as it's less than ten tefachim, high or deep, even if it's not plantable, such as a rock formation or a crevice filled with water, then it is still considered to be part of the sale because it's ancillary to the surrounding soil. So granted, a crevice can be filled with water and still be part of the sale, but that's not the requirement for it to be excluded from the sale. Even if it's not filled with water, as long as it's ten tefachim deep, it is still excluded from the sale because of the desire of a farmer to plant, to work, to farm one contiguous piece of farmland. Let's go on. Amar <coughs> now, if I had to tell you the title of this next piece of Gemara, it would be as follows. Up until now, all we've discussed are the vertical dimensions of a property that is not included in the sale. What about the horizontal dimensions of the property? In other words, what? so, so let's say something is less than 10 tefachim high or deep. But what if it's rock that's like, it's like a huge piece of rock that's just very shallow? Is that included in the sale even since the guy can't plant on it? That has not been addressed in our mission. So this is really what our Gemara has to undertake at this point. So Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Troshim Sha'amru, Beis Arba'as Kabin. Now the word Troshim explains the Rashbam is um, that what we're talking about are, um, are crevices that are filled with water. And, he's, and what the Gemara is essentially saying is, is that even though a crevice that's filled with water, as long as it's ten, less than 10 tefachim deep, is included in the sale, but that's provided that it does not have the horizontal dimensions of four cobs, <coughs> of a piece of property that could produce four cobs of seed. In other words, if it's that large, that it's four cobs large, so then regardless of its shallowness, it's still not included in the sale. So therefore, it can be up to four cobs, but if it's four cobs or more, it's not, or actually, if, it's, if it is exactly four cobs, it's also included in the sale. <coughs> if it's less than four cobs, it's included in the sale, but anything over four cobs is not included in the sale. Per cube, per cube, per cube. Per, actually, right, per, uh, uh, per core, per core, that is, that is correct. Per core. So it's four cobs per core. Now, I think that's what we're saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Yeah, that's right. So, Amar Rav Ukva Bar Chama Vuhusha Muvla'an Bechameshes Kabe. So, Rav Ukva Bar Chama qualifies that statement as well. And he says, four cobs of crevice or rock is acceptable if it's less than ten tefachim, provided that what? provided that it is not so densely packed together, this rock or crevice, that you have all of the crevice space <coughs> occupying four cobs of what would normally be soil. In other words, what you would need to have is rocky formations spread out among five cores. But if you have four cobs of, rocky, of rockiness <coughs> filling four cobs of space, so then that's also not included in the sale. And so the way that the Rashbam understands it is as follows. If it's less than four cobs, even if it's all contiguous rock, it's included in the sale. If it's more than four cobs, regardless of its level of contiguity, it is not included in the sale. But if it's exactly four cobs, so then it, has to, it can't be all rock and all crevice. It has to be partial rock and partial um, and partial soil, such that you can have up to four out of five cobs as rock, 
and then it's and then it's acceptable. But if it's let's say four and a half out of five cobs that is rock within this five cob area, then that's also not acceptable. Okay. Or let's say four out of four and a half cobs. Okay. Now Amar Rabbi Yochanan, so Rabbi Yochanan disagrees with that previous statement, and he says no. I don't hold that you have to have even that density is unacceptable, says Rabbi Yochanan. What you need to have is if four cobs are going to be acceptable, it has to be spread out over more than 50% of the field. If it's packed more tightly than that, such that it occupies <coughs> less than the majority of the, of the core, so then it's also not acceptable and it's not included in the sale. Boy Rav Chia Bar Abba, Ruban de Miuta Umiutan Beruba Mahu, Teiku. So Rav Chia Bar Abba asks the question based on his Rebbe's teaching that it has to be very sparsely scattered among the majority of the field. So the majority of a base core is 15 cores and a little bit more. So you need to have those four cobs of rock or crevice distributed among that it's 15. widely scattered. Widely scattered among that, but but distributed among that rock or crevice, uh, uh, among that land. The question now becomes: What if it's unevenly distributed, mm -hmm. such that you have some of that 15 cobs is very sparsely uh, populated with rock, and other areas are very densely populated with rock? But when you take a look at the totality mm -hmm. of that 15 core, 15 nasa'as rather. Of uh, uh, which is the half of the core, you see that the totality is uh, f four four cups. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable? So the Gemara says, take a, we're not sure whether that's going to work or not. Mm -hmm. So boy, Rabbi Yirmiya. Rabbi Yirmiya asks another series of questions, mm -hmm. and we'll learn them all to together. <coughs> he says, Kishir Mahu, Kishura Mahu, it's Tadinin Mahu, Derech Akalton Mahu, and on all of these, we have a take. The, the general line of questioning is as follows. I understand that you're telling me that if you have rock formation or crevice formation that's less than 10 fachim deep, as long as it's up to four cobs, it's acceptable. But what if the rocks are formed in such a way where they actually preclude you from farming much more than those just those rocky areas? Mm -hmm. Let's say the rocks are organized in such a way that it creates like a circle a around circle. A, perfect, a, a perfectly good piece of soil. Mm -hmm. But around that perfectly good piece of soil are a bunch of rocks that are scattered such that it becomes very cumbersome to have to schlep over the rocks in order to get to the good soil. So technically, it's only four cops. Mm -hmm. But from a practical level, mm -hmm. it makes it much harder to farm. Mm -hmm. So that's kishir. It's also kishur if they're in a row, a series of rows in a square, like like the Rashban says over there, where you can get in in between the rocks, but it's very hard. Uh, it's dadinin mahu. What if it's like it's dadinin, which is like an animal's, like a gazelle's horns, so that the rock formation flares outwards, also again making it more difficult to get in there. And akalaton, if it's a crooked line bending back and forth so that it's not, it's not so easy to circumvent this line of rocks with the plow. In all of these cases, the Gemara says take. Now, Tana, Im afilu kol nimdad ima. If there's one singular stone or one singular rock, even if it's less than four cobs, it cannot be me uh, measured together with the property sale. Now, there are a number of ways of understanding it. The Rashbam simply understands that this statement is related to the next line of the Gemara, which talks about a rock that is right up <coughs> against the borderline of the property in question. And essentially what the Gemara is saying is that if the seller want, has, there's a rock right on the borderline and he wants to sell the property, he's not allowed to count the rock as part of the sale, even though the rock is a small rock. Why is that? The only time that we require the buyer to take the rock as part of the acreage is if it's right in the middle of the property. Mm -hmm. So you're taking the whole thing, you might as well take the rock as well. It's considered to be bottle. Mm -hmm. But if it's mamish at the edge, so then just so just yeah. move around the edge and, and yeah. therefore count the acreage without that rock. Mm -hmm. 
That's one way of explaining it. So Tosfos brings from Rabbeinu Tam another way of explaining it, which is that if the rock is small, but it's a, distinguished, it's a distinguishable landmark, so that it's less than 10 tfachim high, but everyone knows, like, like call it Plymouth Rock, or what are, what are some other famous rocks? What? Rock of Chipotle, yes. The Rock of Chipotle. It's a little bit larger than that, right? The point being is that if everyone knows that that's the rock, uh, the Thornhill Rock, or whatever you want to call it, the Rock Cafe, or something like that. Uh, anyway. It's a hard rock. <laughs> hard rock, yeah. <laughs> right? But uh, the path, the big stone by the path here. All right, yeah, so everyone knows the big stone by the path. I, I don't it's know a, what, it's a I meeting spot. There, but we all meet by the big stone. We'll meet you by the big stone, by the big rock, right? So the point is, is that if it's everyone knows it as a rock, so then that also can't be included in the sale because it's already, it has its own chashivas despite the fact that it's smaller than the requisite size. Okay. Now, and if it's nearby the borderline, so, so therefore the Rashban says that this is a continuation of the previous statement, that if it's even if though it's a singular rock, but if it is nearby the borderline, it cannot be counted as part of the sale. Now, boy, Rav Papa, Mufsak Afr bin Tayyamahu. So Rav Papa now asks the question, what if there's a, 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 a sliver of dirt that is between the rock and the borderline? Can you then say that now the rock is bottled because it's not the requisite size? Or do you still say that it's, since it's by the borderline, it's, uh, it's close enough so that uh, it's not counted? So take, that's not clear. Boy Ravashi, Afra Milamata Vitsunama Lamala, Afra Milamala Vitsunama Milamata Mahu take. And Ravashi builds on that question. If you're going to say that just a small sliver of earth will, cons- will allow you to consider that rock as part of the acreage because it's not Mamish at the borderline, what if that sliver of earth is either has rock on top of it or rock beneath it, and it's just a thin layer of earth? Is that enough to create a division between the borderline and the rock, such that the rock is included in the sale? And here, too, the Gemara says, take it, we're going to have to let that sit. Let's go on to the next mission. Base core offer ani mocher lacha mida bechevel. So let's say the terms of the deal, the, the, the seller says to the buyer, I am selling you exactly a base core of land, and we're going to measure it to be measured by a measuring rope or measuring tape. Right? So he, he's clearly very specific that he's very, he's very uh, punctilious, exact. He means exactly a core, not more, not less. And therefore, Therefore, if after you take possession of the property as the buyer, you discover that there's a little bit less than a core, a little bit more than a core, so then if there's a little bit less, you're entitled to a refund. And if there's a little bit more, you have to pay the, the seller for the extra amount. Now, what happens if the terms of the deal were just the opposite? I'm selling you a core of land more or less, or approximately mm-hmm. a core. In that situation, it's clear that the seller and the buyer are not going to be sticklers for exactly a core. And therefore, if it's a little bit more, a little bit less, there's no legal action that can be taken, provided that that little less or a little bit more is not more than a rova of a kav, a quarter kav per <coughs> sa. So if, it, if you have a core, let's say, which is 30 saws, it's 30 quarter kavs. How much is 30 quarter? What's 30 times a quarter? Seven and a half. Seven and a half, thank you. So as long as for per quart, there's not more than seven and a half cobs of additional or deficient property, the deal stands as is. But yoser mikan yasecheshva. But if it's more than that, so then you have to calculate how much is owed, and either the buyer has to return the excess to the seller, or the seller has to return the deficiency to the buyer. Now mahu machzer lo. Now, what does, if in the case where the buyer has gotten too much and it's more than seven and a half cobs for the core, what does the buyer have to give back? Does he have to give back the property or does he have to give back 
the value of the money, the cash for the... Or just to the margin of error, all the way back to the... That's what we'll discuss in a minute, uh, but that's not the question I at see. this point. The question at this point is, what does, he, what does he give the seller? Does he give him back that strip of extra strip of land, or does he give him back cash? So the Mishnah says, since it's not practical to use such a small swath of property, you give him back cash. However, the imratza machzir lo karka. But if the seller is agreeable to it, and he wants to take the land, then you, then you have to give him the land. It was really an accommodation to give him cash instead of the land, because mm-hmm. what's a guy going to do with a small piece of property? Balama amru machzir lo moz. Because why, after all, did the rabbi say that he's entitled to get cash instead of that small strip? Liafos kocher shel mocher. It's only to uh, to benefit the seller because she imshir besada beis tisha kabin uvegina beis chatsi kavu chedibur abikiva beis rova machzulo esakarka. He says because if the amount of excess land that was given to the buyer is so much that the seller can actually use it as an agricultural property, so then taka the rightful thing to do is to give him back the property because and this is based on something that we've learned before, that the minimal size of a, a wheat field is nine cobs. The minimal size of a seed field for seeding, let's say flowers or, or vegetables, is a half a cob, and according to Rabbi Akiva, it's a quarter cob size. So <coughs> in those situations, depending upon the use of the property, you give them back the property. But if it's smaller than that, then the seller has a right to say, what am I going to do with such a small piece of property? Give me back the cash. Suppose if the seller has property adjoining. It could be. If he has property adjoining, then he's entitled. Mm-hmm. And this goes back to what Paul was suggesting before, that if there's an, a, an, an over-delivery of land, then the buyer can't say, well, I'll just bring it down to less than seven and a half cobs of excess. Because let's say you gave me eight and a half cobs too much. Right? So I'll say, well, I'll just give you a, uh, the value of a kav and make it down to set. No, 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 you can't do that. Once we've ascertained that there's been a, an, an excess amount of land and it goes beyond the seven and a half, which is the acceptable threshold, then I have to give you back all the land or the value for all the land. So it turns out like this, the way the Rashbam explains it. Seven and a half kavs per core is the threshold for, for whether or not there's been too much given to the buyer. If it's anywhere between seven and a half and nine cobs, so then the seller is entitled is entitled to a payment, and he can argue to the buyer, I'm not interested in taking the property because I can't really use it because it's less than nine cobs. Once the over delivery is nine cobs or more, so then this the seller is entitled to say, I want the land, and the buyer can say, just just take the land as well. Okay, the Gemara now says Ibayalu, base course stamama. So the Gemara's question is a very legitimate question. Well, all you've done up until now is told me two extremes. The first case is when we specify that it's exactly a court. The second case is when we specify that it's approximately a court. What if there's no specification at all? What if I just say I'm selling you a base court, period? So the question now is, what happens if there's an error in measurement within an acceptable margin? Is the seller entitled or the buyer entitled to a refund or not? So the Gemara says, well, let's see if we can infer it from our Mishnah first. Toshma, base core offer animocher lacha mida bechevel, pachos kol shehu yanaka, yeser kol shehu yatsa. Hastama kahen chaser hen yeser dami, yeser dami, period. Let's try and infer it from the first line of the Mishnah. The first line of the Mishnah says that if the specification is, I'm selling you exactly a base core, so then only in that situation, if there's even the smallest amount of, of, uh, of less or more of delivery of the soil, you can take action on that lack of precision. So it sounds like, by inference, that if there was no, speci- if there was no stipulation at the time of the deal that it's exactly a core, then it goes back to being approximately, it's like, it's like saying approximately a core and there's no action that can be taken. But wait a minute, says the Gemara, that may be something you infer from the first case. But Ema Seifa, now let's look at the second case, the other extreme. The second case is the other extreme where we say approximately a core. And only when you say approximately a core, because you specified approximately, 
is there an allowance for a little bit of margin of error without any action being taken? It sounds like if you didn't say approximately, so then you can take action even if there was a slight error, a slight margin of error. So it's just the opposite inference from the previous line. So the Gemara says, Elamiha So the answer is, says the Gemara, you can't really infer anything from our Mishnah. We'll have to look elsewhere in order to be able to derive what the law would be when you just say stam, when you just say stam, a base court. Okay, we'll hold it here for today. I'm wishing you a good Arab Shabbos.